welcome to uh, the webinar that we're putting on with the Digital Culture Network, part of the Arts Council uh, and Google Arts and Culture. So can I please, uh, before we kick off, just start with a couple of very, very quick housekeeping rules. Uh, the first is, uh, if you're not a panelist, please, please um, turn off your cameras uh, and mute. Uh, that would be enormously appreciated. Thank you. Uh, the second is, please feel free to use the chat function for questions. We sincerely hope we'll get to some uh, by the end of the session, but we'll um, we'll see how we go. And thirdly, we are recording uh, this session uh, for it to be uploaded to the Digital Culture Network's YouTube. Um, and in terms of the Digital Culture Network, if you didn't or if you weren't aware of them, the Digital Culture Network is an initiative by the Arts Council to help build digital skills uh, in the sector. It's made up of nine tech champions uh, based in our nine regional offices that help arts and cultural organizations with digital skills, digital capacity build, uh, and they help through one-to-one -one support, uh, through training, and through the production uh, of kind of resources. And it's also kind of quite good timing because it's a, the Digital Culture Network is a year old. Uh, throughout that time, we've been very, very lucky uh, to be supported and built up an excellent partnership with Google Arts and Culture. Uh, and over the last 12 months, they've run via their network of Google Garages a number of digital skills training days. Uh, and most recently, uh, published Connected to Culture, kind of an excellent resource, which Emily from from the team will talk about a little uh, a little later. Uh, so, kind of because of the publication of Connected to Culture and the one year anniversary, it felt like a great time to have a webinar. Uh, and the subject was kind of blindingly obvious in a way. You know, it would be the kind of the understatement of a very very kind of odd year. Uh, to say that kind of coronavirus has had a profound impact on arts and culture. But what we found is that lots of organizations are using new technology, digital technology, to either kind of rethink uh, the way that they're producing creative content or even their business models. So what we wanted to do uh, was get a number of organizations together to just tell their stories and their experiences over the last couple of months. Uh, and on that panel, we have uh, Naomi Wilds, who's a producer uh, at Adverse Canva. Naomi, do you want to say a quick hello? Hi, yes, hello from me. Nice to be here. Hi, Naomi, thank you. Um, Adam Constive, Marketing Manager at the Met, Berry in North Manchester. Adam, do you say hello? I do. Hello, everybody. Hello, Adam. Uh, Hannah Fox, Director of Projects uh, and Programs at Derby Museums. Where are you, Hannah? Are you there? Are you on mute? She just disappeared. I think she'll be back. Okay. Thank you, James. Uh, a brilliant segue. James, you're next. Uh, tech, champion, uh, tech champion for the Digital Culture Network with a specialism in data and analytics. Uh, James has already said hello, but do you want to say it again? Hello, everybody. Um, and finally, then, Emily Pullman from Google Arts and Culture. Is Emily here? Yes. Hi, everybody. Hi, Emily. OK, so so let's kind of, if that's the preamble, let's, let's kind of get into the questions because uh, we've got 45 minutes and there's lots of great points and lots of great experiences that I want the panel to share. So the first question really is to Naomi. So Naomi, you kind of, at the time of lockdown, you were working on a project based on the moon landings. Do you want to tell us about how that project kind of changed in light of kind of what had happened and the types of considerations that you needed to kind of factor in as the project kind of changed? Sure. Well, Adverse Canva works primarily with contemporary storytellers and musicians, but this was a project working with young people in care across Derbyshire, which is quite a rural and um, dispersed um, area. And it was actually two projects that were seg segmented together. One was using storytelling to capture people's memories of the moon landing broadcasts 50 years ago. So teaming the young people with elders in the community who remember that, not, not necessarily huge elders, but yeah, elders. And then the other was um, working through music. So um, taking those memories and then creating new original work by the young people that was kind of stimulated from the memories that they collected in stories and music. And um, initially, the, the projects actually started earlier in the year. So they were already going when lockdown hit and we decided to move them straight online. They were physical meetings where people were getting together, but we went straight online to Zoom. And that meant we had to do a lot more planning. Uh, we needed, we were working with creative mentors who work with the young people one-to-one, -one, and we needed a lot more of their time to sort of work out when these meetings should happen. Um, the sessions were shorter, uh, they were more frequent, 
um, we had to do a lot of kind of offline working in order to make the most of the online sessions and, and sort of start working in a much more fluid way just to respond to what was happening and, and happening in the young people's lives as well. So the, the projects initially, um, the, 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 work, the work happened and it happened more frequently, um, but there, there are innate challenges, I think, of trying to do this kind of a project online. Uh, and Naomi, a, qu a quick question for those who maybe aren't, aren't familiar with the project. So what were the outputs? So by working with the participants, what was kind of what was the end goal? Was it did you say was it the creation of content in the ease of music or some kind of storytelling format? Yeah, there was. We were documenting, aiming to document fourteen memories um, and have those in an archive at the Derbyshire Records Office, but also to create an exhibition that would be at the Records Office and some performances, so performances that would link with local events, Worksworth Festival, Altitude Festival. So it was quite a um, multi-platformed um, project, but yeah, it was about archiving memories, that was the essence of it. Uh, and Naomi, so when we spoke, you know, when you were describing the pivot that, that, that you had to make, you know, on paper, it seemed as if actually the move to digital might make things a little more straightforward, particularly kind of regarding communicating with, engaging with the participants, but actually it kind of turned out that there were a lot more considerations that you needed to factor in and things that, that couldn't easily be replicated from the real world onto a digital platform. Do you want to, so do you want to kind of tell us about your experience there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, bearing in mind that, you know, as I said, Derbyshire is a very rural county, um, you'd think that going online would make it easier. You'd cut down on all that travel and be able to just deal with young people wherever they are. But actually, um, for these young people who have quite disrupted lives anyway, um, their access to digital technology, whether they've got the phone minutes, whether they have internet at home, um, they also have their care situation has changed over the course of the project for some people. They're living with people who maybe don't support the project, who don't want them to be involved. And ordinarily, the creative mentors would literally go to their house, um, make those arrangements with them, pick them up and bring them to a group session. And a group session online is a very different beast to a group session in person. We would normally have food and drink. We'd have a socialising um, part of the meeting it's very much about human relationships and um, we, we can't do that in the same way and in the, in another way you know the project was linking those young people with other people talking to them about their memories um, and we, that's very difficult to do we have had some sessions where young people and their mentors with all the safeguarding involved have linked up with people and collected memories online but that's that's we we haven't been able to do that very much because we've had to sort of focus on the relationships that are there and keeping in contact with the young people and and that kind of focus on the relationships and that personal contact that you would have done kind of one to one and face to face you know how 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 do you kind of how do you translate that kind of digitally what were the types of things that you needed to put in place to make sure that that kind of contact, which is key, you know, also happens as the, as the, as the project moved digitally. Well, well, we've had to really um, kind of go back to the, the relationship between the young person and their mentor and give the mentor extra time to deal with that young person one to one. So just ringing them up on the phone, um, having m many more conversations about what they're in, what they're up to, what they're interested in and kind of finding ways to work with the young person wherever they are. I mean, the, pro the project was always designed to be incredibly responsive and flexible around the young people's circumstances, but we're having to sort of move away from our initial outcomes and just work with young people. And there's been lots of positives that have come from that, but it, we're, the actual, we're, we're having to be flexible about outcomes so actually whilst there was a strong oral history and heritage imperative um, we're now looking at potentially um, young people documenting their experience of the pandemic as a very different world uniting experience than the moon landing broadcast and sort of contrasting so that's our that's that's one of the lines we're going down at the moment but we'll have to see whether the young people are interested in that and want to do that Brilliant. Naomi, thank you very much. So Adam, t I suppose to you next, you know, I think what's been fascinating about, about hearing about the Met is its involvement with United Be Stream and actually 
that experience bringing some really kind of unexpected benefits and it being kind of really eye-opening for the organization uh, kind of generally. So I suppose, do you want to kind of start at least by, you know, briefly telling us about the Met, uh, about the United We Stream project and how the two things came together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the Met, if you don't know, we're a multi-use art centre in Bury on the, the northern edge of Greater Manchester. Um, we've got two performance spaces, but we're quite small. We're sort of 400 standing capacity and 100 standing capacity. And we've got rehearsal spaces and our own recording studio um, on site. And we're primarily known for a very busy sort of live music programme, um, uh, best known for sort of the folk music that we put on and that in the very sort of broad terms of sort of folk inspired music. Um, United with Stream is a project led by the GMCA, Greater Manchester Combined Authority, um, uh, in conjunction with Sasha Lord, who's the man behind Parklife Festival in Manchester, is also the nighttime economy advisor uh, for Greater Manchester, and also in conjunction with Andy Burnham, uh, who's the mayor of Greater Manchester. Um, we'd been working with the GMCA for a little while. Berry was supposed to be designated the, um, or was designated Greater Manchester's first town of culture for 2020. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with the GMCA as funders behind that. Um, so they knew our skill set and knew what we, we had in house for a, a concept like United We Stream. So United We Stream itself was a, a concept of, it started in Berlin and Manchester was a second area to pick up on it in the world. Apparently there's now 64 cities around the world running with this platform. Um, uh, the concept of it basically being to put on entertainment of a high quality streamed in return for donations. Um, it's been a fantastic learning curve for us really. But what has been nice has been us being able to take our first steps into that idea of live streaming while only having to have only having to deliver what we know we're good at. What the what the GMCA needed from us was little more than a fantastic room and the great ability to put artists on stage and live them and make that sound work, um, which we knew we could do even under fairly limited capacity. Because this was all evolving at a very sort of fast rate, while us, like many other venues, were playing the the whack-a-mole of event cancellations and customer refunds and all that, that contact. Um, this concept came around and was rolled out from April the 3rd. So really quick, within a couple of weeks from from lockdown, this, this thing's together. Um, and it is a result of hugely of, of collaboration. Um, the streaming side is uh, handled by a team from the University of Salford's production, uh, production team. Um, and in terms of programming, uh, there's been collaboration with lots of organisations around the area, like uh, Contact Theatre in Manchester, the Manchester City of Literature, Manchester Jazz Festival, um, the Hacienda. Um, so it's been kind of a, a great wish list of collaborators uh, from outside our normal comfort zone, um, who we might not have otherwise have been collaborating with during during this period. Um, don't you've seen, but the, the project's now taking a break. It's had a ten week run. Um, and we've just sort of released the, the headline figures from that. Um, so it's reached seven and a half million streams, um, 207 hours of live content have been broadcast um, with the Met being used as a production hub. Not all of that has been live here on our stages, but the production base has been in, in our place. Um, it's involved 338 artists and has raised 477,000 pounds for uh, the, the fund pop that artists and venues and freelancers can apply to. So, so Adam, Adam it, it, it feels as if you know, you've been in quite a unique position because you're talking about bringing in the tech, all the technology from the University of Salford, lots of, kind of really big partners. So how you know how are you how how is the Met going to take some of these learnings forward once I imagine the University of Salford leaves and kind of and the other partners go back to some kind of uh, business as usual? You know how are you going to take some of those learnings forward? Um, well, lots of learning to do. It's interesting because we'd sort of um, we'd been realizing video content was something we needed to make more of. I mean, trying to upskill with just one or two members of staff over the last sort of year. We've been doing artist interviews, backstage things, little sessions we were recording as well. Um, and this pandemic has sort of put a pause on us, and then we've we've skipped a few scenes. We've jumped ahead quite a lot. There's been a lot of on the job learning from. Uh, particularly one or two members of staff who, who are producing stuff. And it's it's strange, you know, we're, a, like I say, we're a small venue. The, the margins for making gigs work are, are 
scale are, are pretty tight. Um, but all of a sudden we're at a point where we think live streaming and technology is probably going to be key to our business or certainly key to exploring our business for the next few uh, months. Um, you know, we're planning to do some live streaming events of our own during July. Um, and there's got to be some experimentation that we're going to look at different platforms, different options, how income can work to support others as a venue and how artists can make it work for them. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, in terms of technology, and there's a bit lot for us to explore. We've taken bits of learning from those teams. We've met some people to collaborate with, but things are still in the air, you know, how it's going to be sustainable. And, and Adam... I think you know when you talk about the projects, you know it it really speaks to one of the defining characteristics. Or at least one of the things that we've kept hearing over the last couple of months is that sense of collaboration and people getting together to make things happen. And it definitely feels like it's been the case with with you, the Met, and United We Stream. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's been really useful. Like I say, that idea of you can always find people who can do one part of our job really well during this. You know, different collaborators. If someone else is picking on programs, someone else can pick up on on delivering it through a different way. And everyone's trying to find ways to make it work and make it sustainable. It, it's been uh, an interesting chance to stop and take stock of where where we're going to go. And um, the useful thing that we've heard from artists, of course, who are doing so many independent live streams, is that actually they're coming back to us and saying venues are still a part of this. Venues are still online curators, if you like. Venues are still making recommendations to their trusted audiences. Um, you know, if you're an artist staying at home, playing the same night, the same set every night online to the same audience, you're not going to keep developing. So it's great to have that feedback from the artists we work with who are eager to re-engage with us as a space physically or online. Um, and also our, our audience is uh, happy to take risks, proud to see that we're putting out high quality work online, you know, to the same production standards that we would have in our physical space and taking risks and trying things um uh, which, which has been great to hear from, from those regular members who probably wouldn't normally be attending a 12-hour hacienda rave um, but are happy to see that, that we're doing high quality work around that and reaching new audiences as well excellent thank you adam so Anna, kind of, to, to you next, how, are you, how are you doing and i think if we get to adam you know a lot of the things that have come from the last couple of months you know have almost kind of happened unexpectedly and you know it's i guess it's similar but different with you guys in that obviously no one was expecting what to, to kind of what happened to happen. But when you had the idea about Derby Museums from Home, actually your kind of objectives for the project and the surrounding work was actually kind of quite well defined. So I, I wonder if you could kind of tell us about Derby Museums from Home and also you know what your aims uh, what your aims were for it. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Uh, I think Derby Museums from Home was uh, sort of in the middle of what we've been doing and it's a culmination of some of the pieces and themes that we started from the beginning. Because at the start, when it was clear that we we're going to have to close the museums and send everyone to work at home, we had three sort of key priorities. Make sure the staff had the, ca the kit and the capability to work from home. So set up a tech and training station to use all the available tech we had to make sure they had what they needed and knew how to use it like email and Zoom and WhatsApp in particular. We don't have a digital department, so that was peer to peer. Make sure that a communication strategy was in place for our staff and volunteers and develop, develop sort of a framework for delivering our offer to folks when they can visit the museums. So that started in our weekly get together. We did a brainstorming session to answer the question, how might we take Derby Museums Digital to engage, support and lighten our communities? And we had some really key sort of principles in this, quality and relevancy. Everyone's gonna be doing this, so we need to make sure it's personal to Derby Museums and our communities and that we do it well. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, look to our existing resources and assets and opportunities to connect with other movements and initiatives. And don't rush. Our community's concerns right now are not about what Derby Museums is doing. They aren't waiting for, with bated breath to see what we're going to put out there. But they're prioritising their families and their jobs and their health. So we need to you know, take our time here. Loads of ideas are generated and really clear themes emerged. And we set up a Google Drive and asked everyone to put raw or completed content into that before they went home. Effectively a massive big brain dump of gallery guides and photos and film clips and sound files and all of those things related to those themes. And then we went home and we also then had to furlough staff. So we've had a course team of staff working remotely who are really grateful that we've got all that amazing content. Our staff had managed to collate in that Google Drive. And from that point, we sort of 
did these steps. We kept it simple, like sharing content via our social media streams, cross-promoting other people's content, like city cultural partners. We've also promoted us and wider national initiatives. And then more com complex, like building ourselves that new microsite, Derby Museums from Home, which features VR scans of past and present exhibitions, 3D scans of collections, showcases fine art collections and resources, etc. A lot of that content we already had, but weren't in one place. And then we've also been experimenting, recording audio conversations between staff and volunteers or people who are going to feature in our programs and developing that sort of behind the scenes content. I'd say it's been a real deep dive, peer to peer learning opportunity. How do you record remotely from people's homes, edit films and audio, build intros and outros and edit websites, etc. And Google and YouTube have been invaluable training resources. Um, getting our communications in, in place from the start was really invaluable. But that sort of coming together again, I'd echo that coming together of folks around a problem and an opportunity, having a sort of organizational mindset of learning by doing and experimenting, co-producing. That's not new for us, but the circumstances and the conditions absolutely were. And we started things like that Derby Museums from Home site that we've been wanting to do for ages, but haven't had either the time for it or perhaps thought that we needed external help to do it. And um, we've learned, I think, and confirmed that we could do it ourselves in collaborations and with the existing tech and resources that we already had. And, and Hannah, you know, when we were when we were speaking a couple of days ago, the one, one of the things that stuck with me was the view saying that a lot of the work that you did was on a fairly old computer, uh, and, you know, and which kind of runs counterintuitive to this notion that in order to make the most of the opportunities that are available, it needs to be the new tech, the shiny new thing. And that just that hasn't been the case with uh, with museums from home, has it? No, it hasn't. I mean, you know what? I'm lucky enough to have a sort of design background, so I'm familiar with tech, but the computer that I'm talking to you on now is a 10 year old Mac. And we just like looked in our cupboards and found what we had at work that we could start up and see, does this work? Yeah, this works. Okay, this means this is part of our assets. Let's just make sure it can use the existing platforms that actually are really native to a lot of these older computers too, because they're web based. And, uh, and utilize those. We don't have to think we can't do it because we don't have the tech. We have actually got it, even in old phones that people had, that we could then set up, up someone on WhatsApp who might not have um, a, smart, a smartphone. Um, so, you know, definitely be looking at the existing assets that we have and seeing how we can reutilize that, not, not being constrained by thinking we can't because we need something new. Uh, and Hannah, I wonder if you could tell us also about the editorial process. You mentioned the Google Doc and the brain dump and getting ideas down. You know, how does it go from there? Uh, you know, once once you've got the brain dump, how does it? You know, how do you work out what the plan is for the next kind of week, couple of months? You know, with with your yeah. mind. It starts from that that core framework we all brainstormed at the start. You know, we we've got existing exhibitions we were just about to open, themes that our museums are known for, like Joseph Wright of Derby, um, and uh, the the theme that we were part of connected in with a sort of national program, which is Florence Nightingale's bicentenary. So we've got some core themes that we could hook stuff to, and then we've also got other content that. Um, that actually we'd been with maybe from past projects that could be revitalized and reused. So we have a core group of folks that will, including our sort of programming, marketing, anyone that wants to jump on that connection. And we use Trello to then plan out what we might do over the next month. And then people then work on those individual pieces across the disciplines and start pushing those out and promoting them. Um, so it's a real collaboration across our disciplines, which is again naturally, naturally how we work anyway, but it's really been um, sort of an exemplar of that for us internally. Yeah, and I think it's a quick question now to, to Adam and Naomi, you know, they're quite powerful points. Again, that internal collaboration to work out what the editorial strategy is, but also that real sense that actually, you know, more people have the tech in the organisations that you work for to do these sort of things. Was that your, you know, was, was that your experience? Adam, maybe not with the tech, but possibly with the, with the editorial kind of side of it as well. And Naomi, what can... Does that kind of does that resonate with you? You dropped out then, just as you were saying what it was that was resonating. Uh, just uh, so, just the, just, uh, just the um, just that sense of collaborating around the editorial strategy and people coming together to work out a way forward, but but also that the tech actually doesn't need to be you know, the next version or, or the latest version or the shiny new thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what we found is people, um, with some of the mentors being 
recording little um, clips of themselves, suggesting um, activities that people might want to try, or just kind of throwing out stimulus to see what, what would engage the young people. So yeah, it was just using your phone and make a little video. And in fact, actually, the lower tech feel the better because that was sort of role modeling. You can do this with whatever mm. and using paper and pen and kind of going to old school, but just communicating it in a in a more like um, digital way so that people can get access to that. Uh, and, and Adam, then you know, a question to you on the kind of on the editorial side, you know, how do you how do you maintain the Met's kind of distinctive vision when you're in a when you're in a partnership with lots of other kind of other organizations, other in some cases, large brands. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good um, good point, and I, I'd sort of echo some of that um, that point that Hannah was making, that you were both making about that idea of just doing it in a fairly low tech way and finding the easiest way just to stay in touch. You know, we've been all over Slack talking about what we want to focus on necessarily, and, and very often we've talked about getting through that stage where it was here's what we're not doing and here's how we're responding to customers, and then actually well, let's talk about what we are doing. And what we can still do, and keeping the, the focus on that, um, where you know we, we do a lot of work on developing our tone of voice and, and and the way that we speak to people. But because we're such a mixed-use organisation, we're different things to different people. You know, we are you know, a folk music venue to some people, to some people we're an entertainment venue, and to a lot of people that we're still in touch with regularly, we're um, a place where uh, for regular meetings for like a youth theatre. We do a lot of disability arts work. And um, we're still finding ways to stay in touch with those groups through Zoom. Uh, and we're facing a lot of the same challenges you were talking about, Naomi, particularly with people who might have not find digital access as, as um, easy as others. Um, but yeah, it's it's tricky. Everyone is working in isolation to a degree, but we all understand the positivity of the messages that we need to continue to put out and how we need to talk about how just because the doors are shut, our work continues and, and placing value on that. Um, it's been great, but we've had high profile partners because they can talk about their element of the work and we can take some pride in talking about being part of that to our audiences directly, um, particularly sort of on, on social media when it feels like people are trying to talk to the entire world. I think we can remember that our tone of voice is still talking to those people who are engaged with us. Um, and hopefully we've, we've managed to do that, take a few people on this on this journey with us. Yeah, you know, I, I think that that's a you know, very, very interesting point, isn't it? Because Adam, again, when we spoke a couple of days ago, you mentioned about kind of maintain using this opportunity to to attract and talk to and engage with the audience that you'd get coming through the doors generally and on a, a normal day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's strange. It's, uh, again, I think everyone sort of touched on this a little bit, but it is we've still got people engaged. You know, we may not be their highest priority throughout this whole period but they still want to know that we're out there or, or in here doing the work that we do within our community and being available um you know we've had lovely responses to we've, we've been doing um facebook live videos talking with artist drop-ins with some of the different artists we work with um just talking about funding staying creative what you're reading or watching and we've just been doing little chats like that every wednesday at four o'clock there's, there's another one today there's your plug uh, on our Facebook Live, and responses we get to that as a much smaller community than we're seeing engage with um, a big name project like United We Stream has been fantastic. You know, we're still part of the creative and local community um, that we can't reach physically at the moment. Grace, thank you. Coming to you next, which is a quick reminder for everyone please feel free to use the chat function uh, if you've got any questions for the panelists. But, James, you know, we've heard a lot from uh, Naomi, Adam, and Hannah about their experiences, and you know I think they kind of ring true with some of the things that we've been hearing with the Digital Culture Network, which is safeguarding, using existing tech, uh, kind of adapting how they think about their tone of voice, attracting kind of local but also national and international um, audiences. Do you want to tell us about some of the things that other art organisations have been coming to Digital Culture Network about? You know what 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 are, what are arts and culture kind of particularly interested in? in this sphere and have been over the last couple of months? So yeah, it all started off when it all kicked off, um, people getting in touch about working remotely because you know everyone was suddenly at home and then how were they gonna stay in contact with each other and what could they use? And usually 
the recommendations that we could give people is that you know you've usually got the technology already and as, as we touched on already it, you've probably got an old phone or an old laptop and stuff and that is actually okay you don't have to have the top tech to keep in touch with people um, so we started to create resources around all the different things that we started hearing from different um, uh, individuals and organizations because it was common themes so working remotely so we put together some resources around that so we could easily share these kind of things with everyone as it was happening and then once once we got the past working remotely people were looking at content generation what can they do to get stuff out to their audiences keep them still engaged and it was live streaming and things like podcasting and stuff like that and again what technology can they use what's easily accessible and, and uh, we touched on it earlier around safeguarding and if you're interacting with different audience groups with you know, safeguarding is such an important part of that and there needs to be guidance around it. And there's some fantastic stuff out there already. So we were essentially just signposting to what's already already there and available and helping the organizations keep that in mind. So instead of just inviting everybody into a massive call and all this kind of stuff, you have to be really careful with certain groups that you're speaking to. So um, mm -hmm. I recommend having a look at the, rec the resources we've got. And you know if that's something that you, you're looking for in your organization, then do check it out. Um, and then the second stage, which, we found that m nearly all organizations we spoke to were really keen to take this on board. And it was making sure that the content you're putting out is accessible because there's so many different groups. We talk about safeguarding, but there's different groups when it comes to accessibility. And that's not just external, it's your internal teams as well. So how you don't want you don't want to leave anybody behind. So making sure that the platforms that you're using, people can um, it could be um, the transcription services, things like that, you know, so people can still engage and work collaboratively and no one's left behind in that way. Um, and then we went on to things like your website. So we had loads of requests and uh, help uh, ask, ask for support around websites because the objectives of a website change significantly from the off because usually we go to a website, say for a venue, and it's, it's all about how to come here when the shows are coming, all of those things were gone. So what is what should be the objective of the website then? Is it the content you're putting out, you want to push them towards that uh, and engage with the content in that way or drive people to sign up to your newsletter? Because what we found is email as a channel, is it's always been important and it continues to be, but over this period, it's become even more important because a direct way into people's inboxes, the open rates have increased that we've seen because people are at home, they're checking their emails and things like that. But the way you can deliver content to people through email as a communication channel, and it's direct, it's, it's been fantastic. So um, pushing people to silence that on your newsletter, I think it's been great. Um, and yeah, we've had more people get in touch around social media and how people should engage with the audiences on that as well. So we've had the full range of, um, of like marketing and uh, digital approaches and, and how organizations can embrace them and as I said before usually it's probably stuff you've already got that you can use and you can take on board and uh, it's just probably just training the staff up and keep, keeping them involved and helping them take them along on the journey with you um no. sorry, carry on. <laughs> no, carry on, please. lastly um it's there was a massive rush to put out free content in the early days and everyone i think a lot of people were overwhelmed by how much was out there um even myself i was i was, I was like wow this, I, i'm not even in the right headspace to take any of this on board mm -hmm. um so uh, continuing that but monetizing it in some ways i think is the next step for long long-term um long-term uh, approach to this because we don't know how long this is going to last for uh, we still need to make some money some way um, and bring revenue in and how can we monetize that so uh, we've got MRR uh, e-commerce tech and merchandising tech champion and she's she's been very busy to talk about the kind of next steps for that and how we can use the platforms we've got use the content we're putting out and the communities that we're uh, delivering that to and then try and generate revenue in in a nice way really brilliant thank you James so I guess back to the panel now Naomi Adam and Hannah obviously you know the last couple of months uh, has has been kind of quite quite a learning experience for everyone. Can you kind of tell us, you know, what are the types of things that you're likely to take forward? And you know, have you noticed any kind of digital skills that you think you need to bring in house based on uh, based on what's been happening over the over the last couple of months? So Naomi, do you want to go first? Yeah, I I think um, 
be honest, we're still grappling with the business of how we keep in contact and, and where we go from here with this project. And I'm sure that um, we will have lots of lots of bits of learning that we will want to take forward immediately into this next step because we're finding that we're having to plan and um, replan very responsively. So we're just thinking about the next couple of weeks and, and you know what the circumstances are now. Um, I think the big the biggest thing I'd say in terms of uh, longer term objectives are sort of changing the economic model of the way that we're working because the what's at the heart of our project is freelance artists and practitioners and our project budgets we're, we're not main funded we're on project budgets our funders have been brilliant in being flexible and being responsive and, and being able to change the way we're working with this but what's underpinning everything is those freelancer artists and when there's talk about um, universal basic income and you know the possibility of people being paid so that their security is assured then they can be so much I mean everybody's creative and everybody's doing their best but to, to have that level of security and then be able to just be responsive to what what you need to do I think would really change the picture Excellent. Thank you, Naomi. And Adam, what about you? Obviously, we've heard about the desire to keep going with the streaming. Kind of what what else is what else is stuck? Um, I mean, it's it's like a, a sort of said the um, that ability to find a way to keep supporting and working with and being valuable to the artists that we work with at every level, from performance through to you know workshop deliverers and, and freelancers, like like Naomi said. Um, it's how we augment that physical space, understanding that that's maybe not the thing we're going to absolutely rely on for the next few months, and there might be a longer term sort of period changing that. Yeah, we need to invest in equipment, both for us to produce content, but also for some of our service users to engage with it as well. You know, we need to find funding for members of our Met Express Disability Arts Group to make sure they can access the online networking, the social sort of element that's so important to them. Um, there's a little bit of learning to do at every level around production, around sharing, around getting um, you know, that great understanding of analytics. I'm looking at James there, while well, we'll be looking at your, your, um, your um, posts again. Um, understanding the impact and the effectiveness of it, it's, it's something that we're all doing. You know, we're all going very much off sort of headline figures and, and lovely feedback, but we need to understand um, how digital really makes meaningful engagement for all the different audiences we work with. So um, lots to do. Absolutely, Adam, thank you. So Hannah, thoughts on, on that kind of legacy question? Yeah, I think most of what we've started will we'll now continue to grow, build and grow as business as usual after we open, reopen, reopen the museums. Um, for example, like our virtual tours and remote interviewing and audio creation, live streaming activities to people at home, and working to increase the accessibility definitely of, of that digital content. Some programmes that were going to be on site will actually now be delivered both on site and online or even completely online. And I think also how we continue to complement this with a tangible offer for those who do not have access to a computer regularly. How do we offer and deliver resources to people at home, some of which could be still digital, like audio files you can download on your phone if that's what you have, or printed activity packs that have things to do easily from home with existing materials. So I think we're really excited to have staff and volunteers returning as we reopen, who bring these new skills and ideas to the table to build on what we've started and also to continue to do that across our disciplines. So who has the skills or wants to be involved? For example, like our resource director is hosting our live quiz online at the start of July, and our curator, assistant curator of Making Eilish leads our 3D scanning program, and our volunteers are transcribing the content we're doing. So, you know, that's something that we really want to make sure that we're continuing and build on from what we've started. Uh, and what about museums from home? What's the future of that there? Is, is that going to evolve and continue? Yeah. I think it, I think we think it probably will. I mean, we're renewing our web presence at the moment with a view to the opening of the new museum of making, and that's sort of been happening in parallel. And and we thought, well, and we talked with our team, like, do we wait until that happens? Do we feed that into it? Then we just said we can just do this alongside it, and then we'll assess as we develop that web presence how we tie into it and and inform that presence. And it's definitely going to do that. So it could be that something that's a microsite parallel to our main organisational website, it could blend into it don't know yet but that's all up for grabs 
Brilliant. Thank you, Hannah. So at this stage, I think I'm going to bring in Emily. So Emily, we've heard quite a bit from the panelists and from James around the types of things that the arts and culture organizations are thinking about. And a lot of it actually is picked up uh, in Connected to Culture. So I thought it'd be a good time to just do to just tell us a little bit about that and kind of what's in it and what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. So I've just put the link in the chat. So it's available for everybody. So you can check it out and um, share it with whoever you think might find it useful. But basically, here at Google Arts and Culture, um, you know, just just kind of um, bringing to light all of the things that we've heard from all the panelists here today um, in terms of reimagining live events and um, looking for ways to generate new revenue streams through fundraising and just kind of like being really flexible with roles and responsibilities, um, trying new things, which is what we're all trying to do in this in this crazy time. Um, we have put together a resource, and it's it's basically tools, tips, um, and more inspiration on what you can do to try to um, just kind of make sense of everything that's going on and, and continue your cultural programs online, uh, online, and and just you know do whatever you can to to kind of pivot. And I think it's it's um, really important to know that you know as a lot of our panelists have said today you know we're all we're all just kind of trying new things and seeing what happens and it's not about getting it right on the first try but you know just kind of understanding what's available to you what you can already do you know with the technology and the tools that you have and just trying something new and seeing what happens and then continuing to iterate and and improve on that and um so definitely check out the playbook um we really hope it's helpful uh, feel free to share it, and there's also a link for feedback um, because, like you, you know, we're all we're all learning, and we want to continue to improve and iterate it for um, the benefit of everybody, really. So, hope hope you find it helpful. Excellent, thank you, Emily. Okay, so so that that's it for the session. Let me kind of thank you, kind of thank our panelists. Uh, so, Naomi, Hannah, Adam, Emily, James, uh, your time. That uh, is, is enormously kind of appreciated. Thank you for joining us. And it's been fascinating to hear everything that's happened over the last couple of months. And to everyone that's listening and watching kind of at home or whatever, uh, thank you again for your for your time. Uh, I just want to say, you know, hopefully it's been interesting um, or inspiring even. And if it has proven inspiring, please get in touch with the Digital Culture Network or get hold uh, of Connected to Culture so that we can help you with your next steps. Uh, so other than that, let me say thank you all uh, again. Thanks for your time. Have a great day, uh, and we will catch up with you all very, very soon. Thank you very much.